Hey people, so Civ 3 is a game with a bunch of different options and a ton of replay value, but despite this, if you play the game a lot, often you might find yourself running into a bit of a routine. So to help you with that, I've come up with a, a few strategies that I think will help you just spice things up a bit. So the first one will be the Temple of Artemis Sistine Chapel strategy. So, for this strategy, you could do any map type, really. I'd probably recommend Pangaea or Continents, though. You could do Archipelago, too, but remember, we're doing Temple of Artemis. And Temple of Artemis is not a fantastic wonder, and it's relatively stronger on Pangaea or Continents maps. So, I'd probably go with those. So, I'd recommend a sieve that has a unique unit that's a knight. So, that means Japan, Arabia, India. It also means China. Uh, but China's not a religious sieve, unlike the other ones I just listed, and the strategy isn't quite as strong if you're not playing as a religious sieve. So what's the point of the strategy? Well, what I normally do for happiness is I get a ton of luxuries and I build markets in all my cities, and that gives you a ton of happiness. That's part of what allows me to conquer so effectively while I play Republic. And I want you guys to be able to do that too, but I know you guys, or at least some of you guys, struggle a lot with getting enough luxuries to be able to use them reliably for happiness. So I wanted to make an alternative strat for this. So the idea is you build the Temple of Artemis, that puts a temple in all your cities. Um, then you go for cathedrals in all your core cities as soon as you get to the medieval era. Then you do the Sistine Chapel, and all of the effects of your cathedrals is instantly doubled. And remember, those cathedrals are half-priced because you're playing as a religious sieve. One thing you can do to speed this up is you go for chivalry before you go Sistine Chapel. That way you can get Sistine Chapel and all your cathedrals faster um, because you get the production bonus from your Golden Age. From there, you can switch into Republic, and it's going to be fast because you're a religious sieve, and just conquer the world without having too much fear of running into happiness problems. Uh, just one note is if you're doing the strategy, make sure not to do the Great Library because the Great Library will give you education before you want education, and education makes the Temple of Artemis expire. So remember, the Temple of Artemis is what's allowing you to build the cathedral without needing a temple. Uh, and the temple doesn't actually do a lot on its own. So if the temple expires later, that's fine, as long as you have your cathedral. Because remember, cathedral with Sistine Chapel, six frickin' happiness. Absolutely incredible. Temple alone, just one happiness. Not so important. So it expires later, but then you have all the happiness from the cathedral, and that's going to do you wonders. So, the next strategy on our list will be the War Chariot Rush. Now, I've realized that for some reason, everybody is really underrating the, the War Chariot. So when I did my ranking of the unique units, I, I put it rather high, and a lot of people were questioning that placement. And this, is, this article is linked in the Civ Fanatics War Academy, so there's some like officiality behind it. And it lists the War Chariot, chariot as being uh, a bottom-tier unique unit. So you guys really, really, really need to take a crash course in why the War Chariot kicks ass. So that's going to be our next strat. So for this strat, you're going to want an 80% water map, and we want it to be either Continents or Pangaea. Uh, so you're going to research the wheel immediately, and if you don't have horses very close to your capital, just, just start over. We're going to be doing a two-city War Chariot rush. So what that means is you do uh, a barracks in your cap after you get your next settler out. You scout around a bit to find where the enemy capitals are and to trade techs a bit. And then you build a barracks. Uh, you can build a barracks in your second city or you can not build a barracks. It's up to you. You hook your horses and then you just build some more chariots. So you're probably going to want between five to eight war chariots. Any more than that. And if you're doing a two city rush, then you'll run into unit support problems. So once you have your war chariots, what you're going to do is you're going to put them in a really big stack. You're going to switch your production to settlers because you're probably behind in expansion. And then you're just going to walk your big stack at the enemy capital. If you're lucky, there's going to be like a little crook like this one where you can attack them in one turn without them having any time to react. So yeah, you just do this. Boom. You get a golden age, but you'll use this to clean up the rest of the AI. And Portugal is just crippled now. He's got three cities. They're all one pop. No border expands. And we only lost like what? Like one or how many war chariots? Not a lot. We can just keep on cleaning up his cities. And we're in a golden age now. It's not great to get a golden age this early, but we can use it effectively because we can build more of these insanely cheap, insanely effective unique units. Uh, so yeah, and then we can do this to the Americans, we can do this to the Iroquois, we can do this over and over again, and then we just have half the continent to ourselves, and we win the game that way. So our third strategy today is Asshole Persia. 
I found this article that's a study of the inner workings of the military advisor. These are the same calculations that the AI uses when it ha wants to determine how strong you are relative to them. And at the end of this article is the, the conclusion, which is this formula here. And what this formula says is that, aside from the Enkidu warrior, which you wouldn't really want to stack a ton of, the Persian immortal is the most effective unit in the ancient era at making the AI think that you are strong. So, and relative strength is what determines, like, whether the AI declares war on you, the outcome of peace deals, whether you can extort them for certain things. So I'm thinking that there's actually a strategy that you could use that takes this into consideration. So for this strategy, you're going to want to play on a 70% water Pangea map. You're going to want to play the early game as normal, make sure to keep on expanding, but you're going to be stacking a bunch of veteran warriors, and after you're done with uh, ironworking, once you're done teching ironworking, you just turn off your tech completely. Um, you can, I'd encourage you guys to keep on trading for techs to try to keep up, uh, try to get more gold, but don't spend too much gold on tech trading because you're going to need that gold later on to upgrade all the veteran warriors that you built to immortals. So once you have maybe, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 immortals or 20 veteran warriors that you can upgrade, then you upgrade them all and then you just declare war on some people. Now in this save file, I declared war on literally everyone at the same time and I think that messed me up a bit because they, I think they take that into account when they consider making peace with you. Like they think, oh, I got the upper hand in negotiations because he's at war with everybody. Uh, but because of your military strength, because of these immortals, they should be willing to make uh, peace deals where they give you a bunch of stuff. Now, I can't stress this enough. Taking cities is completely optional. That's not the point of this build. You can do it if you want. Do whatever the heck you want with, uh, with taking cities if you can. But it's not mandatory. Uh, but I would t encourage you to take maybe one or two or just like rough them up a bit just so that they're more willing to make a favorable peace treaty with you. And then you do that like on repeat. So as soon as you make peace, you just declare war again on somebody else or on the same civ and you keep doing it. You get more and more techs, more and more gold, more and more cities, and you just generally be a bully to them. Okay, so the last item on our list is Archipelago Wonderstacking. If you haven't given Wonderstacking a try, I'd strongly recommend it. It is a ton of fun. So you're going to want to play an Archipelago map, 80% water, uh, large or huge, and you're going to want to start on an island alone. So you might even like just check scout around the island. Uh, you could even retire if you don't consider that to be cheating, just to check if you are on an island alone. This is obviously a very good island that I have here. It's okay if you don't have that good of an island, though. So what you're going to want to do is you instantly go for bronze working and then you do middle techs. So the first one you're going to grab is the Colossus. And for that reason, I'd actually recommend you don't play as Portugal uh, because as Portugal, you actually get a golden age from the great uh, from the Colossus. I'd recommend the, the Byzantines or maybe uh, Spain would be a good choice. So after the Colossus, you're going to want to get uh, the Great Lighthouse and then the Mausoleum of Mausolus in that specific order. So the Great Lighthouse is actually a very important wonder for this build, because what it does is that prevents AI, if you get it, then the AI cannot move over sea tiles. If that's the case, then they can't meet each other, and if they don't meet each other, they can't trade techs, and that really slows down their technological process. So that will like slow down the game, the early game to a halt in terms of uh, technological progress, meaning that you can nab up all the wonders, including the key tourism ancient era wonders. So ideally, you might get the Great Wall. If you can trade for monarchy, maybe you can get the Hanging Gardens. The Great Library, as always, is absolutely fantastic here. Uh, just make sure that if you go for the Great Library, normally if you do the Great Library, you don't want a tech education. You want the AI to do it for you. But whatever the case, make sure that you're the first civ to astronomy so that you can get uh, Copernicus's observatory. So that wonder and mausoleum of Mausolus is really, really key for wonder stacking. So what they do is they multiply all the gold that you're getting from tourism, uh, and that allows you to have absolutely insane science that will carry you through the rest of the game. So yeah, those are the strategies I think you guys should try. Give them a try and let me know in the comments what you think of them. And if there's any strategies that you want me or other people to try, be sure to post those too. I'll see you guys next time.